Hi, so welcome. We're really glad everybody could come here on a pretty nice Friday. Um, last year it would have been snowing, but uh, this year it's really nice weather. Um, we're really happy to have you here, and we hope this day will be very um, useful to you in, uh, in learning about our program. Uh, we have, uh, so our, everybody has a, a little schedule in front of them. Um, the way we're going to handle this is uh, Don is going to start off. Don Alperio is our associate dean. Um, the school has two, two associate deans, and uh, Don is, is responsible for most of the, the academic affairs of the school. So he's going to give you a brief introduction to the School of Public Health, um, and he can answer any, any questions you have um, uh, on the school. And then um, Adam and I will give you about an hour-long presentation and answering questions on the program. So hopefully that will answer all the kind of academic questions you have, and we'll give you a little bit of a video on Providence um, to just give you an introduction to the city. Uh, then we'll take, a, we'll take a short break, and then um, we're going to have somebody from the Writing Center here, Rachel Poncelli, uh, who is going to come and talk about writing at Brown. Um, we know that a lot of um, students coming in um, have not done any kind of really serious academic writing. And for those of you who want to do a thesis here, um, it's really important that you learn how to write well. And so we've sort of identified that as, a, as an area that we really want to um, put some emphasis on. And so she's going to come and talk to you about the, a lot of the great options that Brown has for, for um, improving your writing and communication skills. Um, then we're going to have some students come in, some current students, who will um, be giving you uh, a chance to ask questions about what it's like to be a student here, um, and how to find housing, what are the good restaurants, uh, what are nice places to visit, all that sort of stuff. Um, then we'll, um, we'll break for lunch, and we're hoping we'll have a lot of faculty and students show up at lunch. We, we uh, usually get people to come for free food. Um, so that'll be from 12 to 1. And then for the, for the after next like three hours, I think, for the afternoon, you've all asked to talk with various faculty members. So you'll be meeting those um, up in their offices up on the seventh floor. Um, and then um, there'll be a short break. And then those of you who still want to stick around, um, some of the students will take you out to dinner. All right, so um, any questions? All right, so that's our, that's our basic schedule. So I'm going to turn it over to Don to give you an overview of the School of Public Health. Um, and then um, Adam and I will come back and, and talk about um, the program itself. All right. All right. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Um, and hey to everyone who's watching. Uh, I'm Don Operario. As Chris said, I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here in the School of Public Health. You have an, an important day ahead of you, a, a full day, but a very important day because choosing to go to graduate school and choosing the place where you want to spend one, two years of your life learning and, and, and Im embedding yourself in a discipline is very important. It's very important that you make the right choice, a, a place that nurtures you, that helps you thrive and succeed, and is invested in your long-term success. So I encourage you to spend as much of the day thinking about whether this is the place that will meet your needs, your needs for academic development, for, for professional development, and for personal um, um, nurturing. Um, that said, I'm thrilled you're here at the School of Public Health at Brown because I think Brown University in general and our School of Public Health are, are very special places indeed. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about our school and some of the features of our school and how we are developing. Um, I want to share with you the overarching mission of the School of Public Health. And as you know, bio, the Department of Biostatistics is one of the constituent departments within our broader school here at Brown. Our, our overarching mission is threefold. Our primary mission, and one that's the most near and dear to my heart, is you. Our mission is to invest in your education, your professional development, and the skills and talents that you need to thrive academically here while you are, you're at Brown and in your post-Brown career. We have every faith that you are the future generation of policymakers, scientists, researchers, and leaders in your field that will advance this, the area of biostatistics and biostatistics applied to health and other uh, policy and uh, 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 social domains. Our second overarching mission is to conduct research, and conduct research that advances our understanding of disease risk factors and the sequelae of disease and illness in order to promote health and prevent 
premature morbidity and mortality across populations. And a third and also a very important ma uh, mission of our school is to conduct public service because we truly believe that knowledge and research um, must be used to advance uh, um, initiatives, policies, and programs in the community. So here throughout the School of Public Health, we take uh, uh, severe interest in using our work and translating our knowledge into practice. What you will hear if you come to Brown repeatedly is our mantra that we here at, at the School of Public Health learn public health by doing public health. What that means is that we will try and to the extent possible make sure that your education is not just a passive education of absorbing information but that we will we, we educate ourselves and we educate each other by having practical hands-on experiences in, in the work that we do, whether it's analyzing data sets, whether it's communicating the importance of data to various audiences, or as I mentioned, whether it's um, uh, using information in community and po policy settings. We learn public health by doing public health. I'd like now to give you an overview of our educational portfolio here in our school. As I mentioned, we have four departments, but we also have many, many degree programs. We have first two undergraduate concentrations, uh, a general undergraduate concentration in public health, and a more spe a specialized undergraduate concentration in statistics. And if you're not familiar with Brown and some of the New England schools, instead of calling um, these uh, as majors, we call them concentrations at the undergraduate level. Currently, we have five master's programs, biostatistics being one of them. Um, the other programs include our two-year master's in public health degree, which is our largest of our master's programs. We have a small but and specialized master's degree in clinical and translational science. This is primarily focused on physicians or people who are working on the front line of health services who want to learn more about the interface between research and the services that they provide. Um, oops. In addition to the biostats master's, we have a master's degree in epidemiology and a master's degree in behavioral and social health sciences. The four, master, the four doctoral programs are, as you're probably uh, familiar, our, our PhD program in biostats, one in epi, one in health services research, and one in behavioral social health sciences. Here are snapshots of the numbers of students enrolled in our various degree programs. Um, what you'll notice first is that we have a fairly large undergraduate degree program by, by Brown University standards that has been growing, and that the largest of our master's programs is the MPH program, followed by the biostats programs. And then you see here the numbers for our doctoral programs. What you, you should notice and, and um, what I find interesting is just the numbers. We have a small graduate community that's intentional, and we hope to keep it that way. Um, many uh, of our peer programs have probably this many students overall, probably the sum of uh, these students in their entering master's class period. We like to keep our program small because we believe in a very personalized, intimate, um, setting for um, the enjoyment of your learning as well as for our, our teaching and our uh, everyday interactions. So I think these numbers, although they show trends over time and growth, um, also show that we value um, a, a favorable faculty to student ratio so that every student gets hands-on attention um, while they're here learning uh, in their programs. Overall, we have 35 tenure-track faculty members across our four uh, departments, but if you consider the many, many faculty we have who are based in our hospitals, who are doing research throughout the, our School of Public Health building and in our, our partner settings, uh, we have in total at the last census count 209 faculty who are public health affiliated. What this means is there are potentially many opportunities for students like yourselves to find faculty who are doing programs of research that could uh, benefit from your contribution through which you could learn new aspects of 
uh, epidemiology, behavioral science, health service, et cetera. Um, and given the, the numbers of students that I showed in the previous slide, this is a, a quite favorable faculty to student ratio indeed. Let me give you a, a very general overview of the research portfolio in our school. We have, at last count, I think this is 13 centers, 12 centers, um, uh, and institutes where, that are hubs of research activity. And these are, these are centers that are nationally known, in many cases internationally known, for their contributions to moving their, the field forward. They cover uh, general topics including addiction, uh, addiction studies, uh, primary care, environmental health and technology, evidence-based medicine, and probably uh, a center that would be very relevant to your interests, a center for statistical sciences. I would say that there, throughout all of these centers are biostatisticians because every aspect of public health or biomedical research relies on and benefits from the presence of biostatistician students as well as faculty. Our newest center in our School of Public Health is called the Hassenfeld Child Health Innovation Institute. We recently received a 12.5 million gift from the Hassenfeld um, family through which we are forming a new collaboration between our School of Public Health the Alpert Medical School, which is just down the road, maybe a 10-minute walk at most, and two of our affiliate hospitals, also very close by to our school, which will allow us to do many, many new things. One of the most exciting and the first um, activities will involve uh, a cohort study from birth of 1,500 children recruited per year, which will be followed over the lifespan, which will allow a team of epidemiologists, biostatisticians, health services researchers, clinical um, faculty to understand an array of health domains that may occur over the lifespan. The three initial topics of interest with this cohort study will be analysis of autism, of asthma, and obesity. And as you can imagine, given the volume of data, this will allow us to understand many, many more health issues that may unfold during uh, uh, early childhood and beyond. Now, a, a, an indicator of any school of public health, good morning, um, is the funding that the faculty and staff bring in. And we are quite proud of the amount of research funds that, that um, are contributed to the university through the School of Public Health. Um, as of last year, I think we brought in just shy of $35 million in direct and indirect research costs to um, the, the research that, that our faculty do. This is a sign of, of good health, and it's, it's actually quite impressive given the size of our school and the number of our faculty, um, the volume of, of research that, that's produced here. Speaking of faculty, our school is growing and as our school grows, the ranks of our faculty also grows. Just last September, we hired, uh, I think it's nine new faculty, um, of whom you already met one, with Adam right there on the top middle. And let me introduce you to um, three of our newest recruits to our faculty. Professor Tong Zheng is a professor of epidemiology, and he's one of the leading international experts in environmental health sciences. Allison Field was a wonderful um, score that we brought down from Harvard. She is now our new chair of the Department of Epidemiology, and she does fantastic work looking at health over the lifespan, very, very much related to the Hassenfeld Institute. And Professor Matthew Mimiaga, who we also stole away from Harvard, joined our Department of Behavioral and, uh, and, and Social Sciences. He has a cross appointment in epidemiology, and he's also the director of the Institute for Community Health Promotion, his area focuses on HIV prevention, also in domestic and international settings. And finally, let me close by giving you a, a, a few glimmers into the types of community service we do. And as students, we encourage you to be involved to the extent that you want to be in using your knowledge and your skills and pointing them outward to our broader community to see how we can help our populations that surround Brown University. Um, and here are just... Uh, 
some, some um, topics of community service that we currently engage in. Um, let, me, let me bring to attention just a few. Do One Thing is an initiative launched by Drs. Amy Nunn and Phil Chan. They're, are, they are both faculty, one in the, the Department of Behavioral and Social Health Sciences, that's Amy Nunn, and then Phil Chan is in our School of Medicine, and they conduct a door-to-door -door HIV and HCV screening campaign. Um, the, the Healthy Food Access Lab is an initiative between researchers here at Brown as well as uh, the departments through the broader campus, which enables researchers and students and staff to think about innovative ways of improving the, the access to healthy food options throughout the city of Providence, and in particular in places that are known as food deserts where due to socioeconomic circumstance, certain, certain neighborhoods may have lack of access to healthy food options. So this initiative brings healthier food options to those sites. Those, so those are two among an array of, of many uh, community service programs, many of which aren't even listed on, on this screen. Here are four of our more exciting brand new ventures in the School of Public Health, and I'm going to touch on each one very, very um, briefly. Um, just in the past maybe five to eight years, when did you all come here? 2012. 2012, okay, so four years. Um, we have launched and have quickly emerged as uh, a national and international site of expertise around evidence-based health care. Um, and Dr. Schmidt is one of the leading PIs in this center. Um, we are launching um, many initiatives, both in the School of Public Health and around campus, around health data science. This is our analog to big data. I know we've heard the term big data repeatedly ad nauseum. Um, we have initiatives to, to think about big data, but rather data science applied to the domains of health. As noted earlier, through the Hassenfeld gift. We are uh, conducting um, many new projects related to early life determinants of health. Um, and we are developing new master's programs and new um, research in initiatives to brand Brown as a leading center in global public health research policy and advocacy. So I think you'll see here our School of Public Health is an exciting place to be. We value education. We value our everyday interaction with our students. We see ourselves as a community of like-minded scholars, thinkers, practitioners, and professionals. Inspired by an uh, overarching uh, goal to improve health and wellness and use many methodologies and uh, academic talents to, to achieve that aim. So I thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Um, I'm happy to open up to questions, but if not, I'll pass it over to, to Chris now. A any questions? All right. Well, thank you for being here. Thanks for listening, everyone. And uh, have a good day. OK. So um, <clears throat> I thought we'd give you a little bit of an introduction to the, to the program. Um, so the way we're going to handle this is I'm going to go through some slides um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Adam for answering questions and of course I'll be able to answer some too. So hopefully uh, we, can, we can get through what everybody needs uh, in that time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So first thing we're going to do is play a little video for you for, uh, for those of you who aren't real familiar with Providence and Rhode Island. Just Welcome to the beautiful state of Rhode Island. Renowned for its stunning beaches and diverse landscapes, Rhode Island, or the Ocean State, is not only a nature lover's paradise, but also a rich historical and cultural destination. Hi, I'm Claire and I'm here in Rhode Island where I'm surrounded by incredible architecture, fascinating museums, and an innovative artistic community. Let's go check it out. Although Rhode Island is the smallest state, it contains 20% of the nation's historic sites. In the city of Pawtucket, Check out Slater Mill, part of the Blackstone Valley National Heritage Corridor. Built in 1793, Slater Mill is recognized as the birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution. It is now a National Historic Landmark and Museum, dedicated to the history of the American Industrial Revolution. 
Nearby, here in Rhode Island's capital city of Providence, you'll find prestigious Brown University and the Rhode Island School of Design, fueling a vibrant academic and artistic community. In Federal Hill, the heartbeat of Providence, discover classic architecture, unique shops, fine dining and art galleries, or catch the award-winning Waterfire, a world-renowned work of art with over 80 bonfires regularly illuminating the three rivers of downtown Providence. To appreciate Rhode Island's three centuries of classic architecture, opulent palaces, and masterful landscape design, head to the city of Newport. With nearly a dozen estates and over 80 acres of gardens and grounds to explore, the incomparable Newport mansions offer visitors the chance to experience American architectural and design achievements from the colonial era to the Gilded Age. And since no visit to the Ocean State is complete without a taste of Rhode Island's legendary seafood, head to Matunic Oyster Farm and Bar in South Kingstown for Pond to Plate Dining. The restaurant's oysters are grown in Potter Pond directly off its waterfront patio. After a short drive, hop the ferry to Block Island to experience rich culture and history nestled among scenic beaches and unspoiled nature. In Old Harbor, a short walk downtown will reveal boutiques, galleries, and restaurants. My time in Rhode Island has been unforgettable. If you're seeking vibrant heritage, unique culture, and one-of-a-kind attractions, then plan your escape to beautiful Rhode Island today. All right, so anyhow, you know a little bit about the state. Um, for some of us who've been here um, for a long time, um, you know, Massachusetts is nearby. Um, and we'll, we'll have a chance to, to talk later in the day about um, all the different opportunities. Um, you have Boston's about an hour away in one direction. New York's about two to three hours in the other direction. Um, as I mentioned to a couple of you before we, uh, while well, we were sort of gathering here before we started, um, Rhode Island has a really nice bus system which you can ride for free and which basically will take you anywhere in the state. Um, these places are not far away because Rhode Island is the smallest state in the country and you can get anywhere within about an hour, I don't think there's any place in the state you can't get to. Um, so um, a lot of our students, and you can talk to them at lunch and so forth, um, you know, go to these places on the weekends. Um, Adam was telling me that some of the students go shopping in New York on the weekends. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's Pro Providence, I found, I moved here a couple of years ago. It's a, it's a very uh, small city, but it's also very um, uh, easy to get around. There's a lot of really good restaurants because we have a, a, a great cooking school here, Johnson & Wales, so a lot of them stay and open up restaurants. So it's a really a really nice place to, to live. Um, there's, there's good theater and there's, um, <coughs> if you like athletics, if you like um, nature and so on, you can see it's, it's easy to get to. So um, let me change from that just over toward um, the, uh, the academic side a little bit and give you, give you an introduction to the program here. So <coughs> as Don mentioned, um, the master's program here is one of several master's programs in this school. We actually have two different degrees. Um, one is a Master of Arts, one is a Master of Science. Um, Brown, being an Ivy League school, likes to think of itself as very Latinate, so we don't say Master of Arts, we say Arts of Masters, it's the Latin term, so AM just means an MA and SCM just means an MS. Um, <coughs> the only difference between these two degrees, really from our point of view, is that the, um, the Master of Science, um, you write a thesis. Uh, next year we're going to be changing that requirement a little bit so that it doesn't have to be a formal thesis. It can be a project, but it's still written. Uh, the only real difference between the thesis and the project is the thesis is basically expected to be of publishable quality, whereas the, the project may not be. Um, <coughs> and so that, that requires you to take one extra course, which is a thesis course. Um, so. Uh, People enter in either program. What we have decided to do um, for next year and in, in, in the following is that because the Master of Science requires you to write, um, students who come in without um, writing backgrounds, um, generally we would enter into the Master of Arts program and then you could transfer into the Master of Science um, you know, if, you, if you want to. Um, if you come in with um, some we do a writing test at the beginning of the, um, of the orientation. And for those students who are identified as having um, writing deficiencies, we will uh, put you into a writing course. And, and Rachel Tonselli is going to be here to talk about that. Um, we found this to be very helpful. A lot of our students this year are taking it. Um, and they're finding that uh, it's a way to um, think about their education in a slightly different way. Um, a, lot of, a lot of our students who are applying 
are excellent in math but have not really done much writing, um, particularly um, in certain academic environments, um, which are those of you who have gone to a liberal, liberal arts school will have, have done a lot of writing, but those of you who have gone to a more science-based school may not have. Um, so what we're trying to do here is, uh, is emphasize that to be a good biostatistician, you have to not only know how to do math, but you also have to know how to communicate. You have to know how to write. You have to know how to speak. Um, you have to know how to be able to, to interact with the people that you're doing statistics for or with. Um, and so that's going to be that's going to be a real emphasis. We'd like all of our students to do a project or a thesis. Um, I think it's a great idea to to do something applied. Um, we just don't. We we we've, we've had situations where students have um, have had difficulty graduating because they they can't get the project done, and so we we don't want to put you know extra stress on people. Uh, <clears throat> um, brief history of our program. So. Um, Don mentioned uh, the School of Public Health. The, officially, the School of Public Health was, was only started in 2013. Um, before that, uh, the Brown started its health um, program with the formation of the medical school and the Department of Community Health back in the early 1970s. And um, as those programs grew, it was recognized that public health was something that, that Brown wanted to diversify into. And so starting in about 2000, um, there was a push to, to, to start preparing for a school of public health. And so various programs were started. Um, those programs um, morphed into the four departments we, we currently have and, and many of the centers. So in 1995, Professor Getsonis, who's our chair and is also the head of the Center of Statistical Sciences, moved to Brown and founded the center. Um, and as that center grew, it started into uh, becoming an academic program. And in 2005, we awarded our first PhD. Um, our first master's degree was awarded, I believe, in 2007. Um, in, in 2011, we formed the, bio, the, the actual formal department was, was uh, created. And then in 2013, with the school, uh, it was formed. Um, we are now not part of the medical school any longer. We're, we're part of the, the School of Public Health. Um, we've been undergoing uh, accreditation this year, which we're hoping to, to, to get formally in June, um, which doesn't have uh, a huge effect on you other than um, as a School of Public Health, all of our graduates are required to take a course in epidemiology and a course in public health. And so starting this year, uh, we have a new online course in public health um, that is not actually one of the um, formal requirements of the degree, but is one of the requirements of the school. So um, all the students are, are, are taking that now. Um, here's, our, here's our master's um, graduate list. Um, it's varied quite a bit. I would say in general the program is growing in size. Um, we are a, our goal is to have about 15 students entering each year, so a total of about 30 in the program. Um, and so we're, we're, we've been sort of building up to that. Um, it's kind of hard sometimes to count the number in the program because uh, some students graduate in three semesters, some take four, some take five. Um, and we also have special students who um, are, we have a program at Brown called the Open Graduate Education Program where if you're taking a PhD, you can also take a master's in another subject. Um, so we, we have a couple of students who've uh, who, who we have one currently who's majoring, uh, who's doing his PhD in sociology, and he's doing a master's in, in, in biostatistics. Um, so uh, we, we tend to have um, a few more, a few more students than um, we necessarily start with. Um, currently, I don't know if this is the the most up to date. This was this was correct as of last fall. Uh, we have 15 PhD students. We generally aim to admit four per year. Sometimes we get more. Sometimes we get less. And we currently have um, 25 master students, although as I say, that number is, is a little bit variable and we're sort of aiming to have, to have 30. And hopefully you'll get to meet a lot of these students today because we've invited them all uh, to lunch. <coughs> and you will meet some at the round tables and, and at the dinner. Um, here's our faculty. Um, we have, um, I don't really know where, oh, I know where Don got the 18 from. That probably includes the adjunct faculty. But they're basically four, 14. Uh, full-time faculty. Um, there are eight on the tenure track. Um, Adam is on the teaching track, and the, he's our expert teacher, as you as you heard him talk about as education. Um, and then we have um, five faculty who are on the research track, uh, which means that they 
um, don't formally have to teach, although some of them do teach um, courses once in a while. Um, but they're they're part of the uh, center, and they do they do research, and you can certainly uh, work with them um, if you want to do a thesis with them. Um, and hopefully, you'll meet a lot of these people today at lunch, or or you may have um, uh, meetings with them. Um, and so this is just a list of of their um, different interests. Uh, our our um, our aim here is to have a very broad faculty. We, we're not a big department, but we try to cover as many areas as we can. Um, that said, I would say that um, we have some, probably some areas that we're a little more specialized in than others. Um, one is certainly causal inference. Uh, we have some of the leaders in the country in causal inference uh, and missing data uh, analysis. Um, we also, as Don said, have this evidence-based medicine group, which um, I'm part of. Um, and that has um, a couple of faculty who are not formally in the biostatistics department, but who do a lot of statistical research. Um, and we also do a lot of work in, um, in high dimensional data and bioinformatics. Um, and so um, you'll hopefully meet um, some of those um, faculty as well. Um, the Center for Statistical Science basic uh, research is um, working with as, as an administrative data coordinating center for large clinical trials, uh, particularly in diagnostic uh, medicine and radiology. Um, and so they, um, they do a lot of work in, in, in diagnostic testing, which is another uh, area that, that we specialize in. Um, so here are some of the other areas that we um, specialize in. We have a very um, flexible our, our, our faculty in, in that um, we don't tend to specialize too much. Uh, we, we, we do both methodological work and applied work. Uh, we work a lot with local hospitals and, and with other um, groups um, that, are, that are doing applications. Um, so here are some of our particular um, areas, uh, many of which I've mentioned. Um, we, we have also areas of interest in, 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 uh, in time series and, and in spatial data analysis. Uh, a lot of us do Bayesian methods. Um, and here are some of the applications. Um, as you probably picked up from Don's talk, there's a lot of HIV and AIDS research in the school. Um, we also, the Center for Alcohol Addiction is, is one of the biggest centers in the country for that. Um, and there's a lot of uh, interaction with the other departments, behavioral and social sciences, uh, health services, uh, epidemiology, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> we have, so this is just basically summarizing what, what Don said. Uh, we have the four, four departments. Um, faculty, there are some faculty who are in multiple departments. Um, and then there are 11 research centers. And many of these, um, all the statisticians are in the Center for Statistical Sciences. Um, several of them are in some of these other departments as well. And those generally will reflect their research interests. Uh, so um, I'm in the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine. Um, and uh, you know, I can tell you a little bit more about that, maybe in the question and answer session. Um, and, and some of these other centers here um, are, are fairly self-evident as to what they uh, do. And, and some of these are actually collaborations with local hospitals and also with other local universities. The Center for AIDS Research, for example, uh, is, is a collaboration between um, Brown, Tufts, and Boston University. There's other areas that you can get involved with beyond the research, besides the research centers. Um, so at the, at the university, um, we, we basically have uh, four schools here. So there's medical, the medical school, there's the um, School of Public Health, there's the School of Engineering, and there's the School of Arts and Sciences. And um, Brown is a very collaborative place. There's a lot of interdisciplinary work. Um, and so there are centers around the campus that do uh, data analytic work and, 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 and statistical work. Um, the, the Department of Applied Math is very statistically oriented. Uh, we also are doing a lot of work with, with computer science. Uh, and then these are some other centers that are not um, located solely in the School of Public Health, but are, but are other, other places in, um, at Brown. Um, so, for example, if you're interested in, in brain sciences and neuroscience, um, there's the Brown Institute for Brain Sciences, and a couple of our faculty are members of that. There's the Center for AIDS Research, which we're very, very heavily involved with. Um, the Center for Computational Molecular Biology, which a couple of our um, faculty are part of. 
um, the initiative in spatial structures in the social sciences, which we also have faculty in, um, the, the digital society initiative, which is a, a, a sort of a new push at Brown to um, um, get into um, kind of the big data area, um, and, and some of these other, other centers as well, um, which uh, are collaborative efforts with many departments at Brown um, and, and to which we're, we're, um, we're part, and you can get involved with if you want. So let me, let me switch over now um, from sort of the, the overview of the university and some of the different areas that you can get involved with to talk a little more specifically about our program and in particular the master's program and what you need to do to, to succeed here. So um, one of the things that we try to do in the admissions process is we try to make sure that the students that we uh, admit to the program um, will have the background knowledge to succeed here. Uh, what we don't want to have happen is for students to come here and struggle. Um, that makes more work for us and it makes more for more unhappy students, which is something we really don't want to have. So um, we've identified um, three areas in mathematics that um, we hope and expect all of our incoming students to be um, proficient in. So um, one is calculus. Um, not all of our courses will require a lot of technical know-how in the sense that some of them are more applied, um, but to be a good statistician it's really important that you be strong in math um, so that you can read the literature um, and have a deeper understanding of, of what is behind all those methods that you're learning about. Um, linear algebra is also very important um, because we deal with matrices all the time um, and because there are um, various technical um, aspects of statistics, uh, particularly in areas like regression, which are very um, uh, related to linear algebra. And for those of you who have studied that, hopefully you've, you've seen those connections before. And then, of course, probability, which is something that is fundamental to statistics, but which we don't cover in as much detail as maybe some other programs do. We, we kind of make an assumption that you have a background in probability. Um, so if you're coming in without having that, um, it's a good idea to sort of brush up on these things over the summer um, while you're waiting to, to start school. Um, there is a summer online course, the Coursera or, or other um, uh, programs like Khan Academy and so forth that you can take. Um, if, if you need some uh, some extra work in that, and we'll um, if you, if you come here, we will uh, Liz will be sending you lots and lots of information about uh, resources that you can you can use if if, if those things are um, something you want to brush up on. And then the other thing we do is two weeks before the start of the semester, um, there's there's basically a two week long orientation here. Part of it is what we call a math workshop, where we go over. We have one of our PhD grad students um, basically give you an introduction. To, um, to the program here, but uh, in particular we focus on those, a quick review of those aspects of math that we think you should know, as well as an introduction to software um, for those who haven't done too much programming. And it's a good way to, to meet your fellow um, classmates. Um, and then there's also, of course, the school has several days of orientation as well. Um, we have been changing the master's program a lot over the last couple of years. Um, in response to a few trends, one of course being that our program is getting bigger. Um, the other is that as the program has grown, uh, we recognize that there's a real difference between a master's student and a PhD student. Uh, when we started this program, um, many of the courses that the master's students take were the same courses that the PhD students took, and that causes issues because um, Sometimes the master students are not as well prepared as the PhD students, and um, that's usually the case. Um, and so they would find the material to be too difficult. The PhD students might find the material to be too easy because the faculty was trying to uh, aim for the middle. So what we've done is we've, we've changed, and, and it actually it's even changed since this slide was made. I just noticed that um, we've, been, we've been talking a lot about this. So, we have a few required courses um, in the program, and um, we are, as, as I think we mentioned, Don might have mentioned, um, 
Brown is uh, starting a new data science program, which I believe will have its first entering students um, the year following. Um, but we are going to start a data science track in the biostatistics program. We hope to have that up and running for next year, if not for the year after. Um, and that's really meant to address the needs of many students who come in who want to get jobs um, as data scientists, data analysts, um, not necessarily go into traditional biostatistics. Um, so what we're trying to do is, is, is have all the students take a set of courses that in common that will give you the fundamentals of the, of the uh, discipline and then allow you some time to do electives um, that will allow you to, to explore other areas. So um, as I mentioned, all students of public health have to take a course in epidemiology. Um, we are actually now um, restricting that to, to, to one of those two courses because um, we feel it's important that students not only learn the epidemiology, but also um, do a little bit of more reading and writing um, to understand how to read the literature and understand the, the, the health literature. Um, Adam has started a new course, which I'm sure he will be happy to tell you about um, on fundamentals of probability and statistical inference. Um, the reason for that course was that our students had been taking the course with the PhD students, which was at a much higher level, and not everybody was prepared for that sort of mathematical difficulty. And so we have a new course which is, is aimed more at the master's students. Um, this first course, um, which is really an introductory course and which our undergraduate um, concentrators take, um, is sort of being phased out for the master's program in the sense that we really hope that everybody's coming in already knowing a little bit of statistics, and so you won't have to take that, that basic course. But certainly if you don't have that background, um, you know, that's, a, that's a good course to start with. Um, then we have two other courses, um, which are our regression course. Um, and we're changing these two courses as well. We're, we're going to actually split this regression course, which now is currently taken with many of the other students in the school and other PhD programs and other master's programs. And we're going to split it in two sections. And the more advanced section would be for our master's students to take, um, would move a little bit faster, and would try to survey um, in a little more detail um, all the different regression techniques that you might um, need to, to, to understand, like the linear regression, logistic regression, Cox regression, uh, mixed models, and so forth. And then Adam started a new computing course this year. Um, we felt it was really important that all students not just learn how to program, but also learn some of the principles of computing, how to simulate data, how to optimize functions, and so forth. And so that is being offered for the first time this semester. And our, our plan is to have that in the future be offered your very first semester, so it'd be in the fall, um, so that you, you get that experience um, up front. And um, then there are, you could take some electives, and I'll, I'll give you a list of what those are, and then for those people doing the SCM, uh, there's a thesis. Normally, um, you, you need eight credits, uh, eight courses to graduate, plus if you do the SCM, there'd be an extra credit, extra course for the thesis. Um, we generally recommend that students take uh, three courses the first semester and then two in following semesters. Um, if you're just doing the AM, you only need eight courses, um, you can either take one course your final semester or some students actually try to finish up in, um, in three semesters. So they would, for, for example, do a 332 or a 323. Um, but we'll, we can talk more about those and I'm sure you might have some questions uh, about that. Um, now, this year we actually have an advanced study plan. Um, this is really for students who come in with quite a bit of statistical background, in particular those who are considering going into a PhD program. Um, so these are actually, they would be taking courses more at the PhD level. They would be taking the, the PhD level statistical inference course and the linear models course, which is, a, which is a technical introduction to linear models in a much more mathematical fashion and then they might take the generalized linear models course in their spring. Um, this will probably change a little bit um, for next year. Um, the important thing to know here is that you'll be getting an academic advisor when you come, and so you would, you would discuss your, the courses you want to take with that academic advisor, and, and you'd go over all of this at that point. Um, we did find this year that some students coming in um, did go into this track and probably shouldn't have. Um, People don't 
oftentimes recognize that graduate level courses are much higher level than undergraduate level courses and um, you may not actually be, be ready for those courses and in fact the, the less advanced courses are actually quite challenging as well. So um, you certainly are welcome to take these but um, we, we, we will probably recommend unless you've, you've had a really strong background um, that you maybe wait for your second year to take some of these classes. Here are some of the other elective courses that we have. Um, these, are, these are courses in the department. Um, we would like students to do electives in the department. There are other courses around the university that you might want to take as well, um, but they typically wouldn't um, satisfy the requirements of the degree. Um, and so this is just a, a, a very wide range of different uh, courses, um, touching on a, a bunch of different topics um, of interest to, to the different faculty here. Um, some of these courses are more advanced. For example, the Statistical Inference 2 is a PhD level course in sort of advanced mathematical statistics. Um, the Bayesian analysis is um, an introduction to Bayesian inference, but, but taught from a fairly uh, technical point of view. Um, lifetime data or survival analysis, um, linear models, generalized linear models, uh, these, are, these are fairly mathematical courses. Um, some of the others are much more applied, like the principles of data analysis, um, the causal inference and in missing data, the clinical trials, and so forth. Um, we do um, allow and certainly um, suggest or uh, advocate that you take courses if you'd like in other departments. Um, for example, if you're going to go into um, economics or finance, you might want to take courses in that area. Um, if you're going into neuroscience, uh, you might want to take a course in neuroscience. They generally don't count toward the biostatistics degree. Because Brown um, charges by the course rather than by the semester, um, taking an additional course will, will cost more. Um, but we do have partial scholarships in the school, um, and so you, you may be able to not have to pay full, full rate for that. Um, we don't offer minors in graduate work, um, but of course these courses would all be on your transcript if you take them. Um, I mean, the one thing to be, to be aware of is that um, it is a good idea when getting a biostatistics degree to try to get as much experience as you can. So even if you're not doing a thesis, you, you may want to get a research assistantship uh, working um, in one of our centers or one of the hospitals or with one of our local employers. And um, that might actually be better experience than just taking a lot of extra courses. Um, our mentoring structure, as I said, everybody will get an academic advisor when you come here. What we try to do is place you with somebody who is working in an area that you might be interested in. So for example, if you're interested in genetics, we would put you with one of the faculty who works in that area. Or if you're interested in, in evidence-based medicine, um, I would probably work with you. And then that would be for the first year. And then for the second year, if you decide to do a thesis, you would then your advisor would switch over to your thesis advisor, who, who may actually be your academic advisor as well. Uh, this is your choice. Um, you do this in, in, in collaboration with the faculty member. Basically, you uh, approach different faculty members to decide who you want to work with, and then um, they become your advisor. Um, as I said, a lot of the faculty, we, we have a very wide range of faculty, um, and there's also a, a lot of other affiliated faculty and other departments that you might want to work with um, to have a sort of a second advisor. Um, typically, there would be two people on your, on your thesis committee. Some of you might be interested in pursuing a PhD later on. Um, we typically every year have a couple of students at least who are interested in, in doing a PhD um, in even in our department uh, and might, for example, come here because um, they're hoping to continue on. Um, we do every year get students applying to the PhD program who are currently in our master's program. Um, the PhD program is very selective. We typically get about 150 applicants and we admit four. So it's very difficult to get in. Um, that said, in the past couple of years, we, we usually have had um, several students from the master's program who applied to the PhD, and we've had a couple who've actually gotten in. Um, 
I always say that there's an advantage and a disadvantage to being a master's student here and applying to our PhD program. Um, the advantage is that we know you, and therefore we know uh, what you can do, and um, we, we don't have as many uncertainties about you. And the disadvantage also is that we know you, so therefore we know your weaknesses as well. And so, um, you know, you might have gotten A's in your courses, but we know based on your performance that you weren't quite at the top of the class. And while you were an excellent master's student, we don't think you would necessarily have been a top PhD student. Um, and so that may work against you. Um, so your admission really does depend on your performance in the master's program. If you ace your way through the master's program and you show a lot of interest in the faculty research and you're you know, a very um, uh, uh, good member of the department, um, that will all be in your favor. Um, one good thing about it is that if you do enter the PhD program directly from the master's program, uh, much of the coursework you will have already done, particularly if you've taken some of the advanced courses in your second year. So um, you will be ahead of the entering that PhD students in the sense that you might have already done a lot of your first year coursework. And so you can finish your courses much quicker. Um, and, and you may be able to get to your research um, in, 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 a, in a more uh, faster time frame. Um, PhD programs generally have a couple of different milestones that you have to pass. Uh, the first one, obviously, is to apply and get accepted into the program. Um, the second one is that at the end of your first year, you take what's called a qualifying exam, which is a set of questions that you go through, uh, you have to answer. Um, and uh, it's usually about a six to eight hour exam, um, which tests your knowledge from your first year courses. Um, if you pass that, then you would go on to form a thesis committee um, and to prepare a, um, a proposal for a dissertation. Uh, and once you pass that oral exam, which basically lays out what you want to do, then you go on and write your dissertation, and then eventually you defend that. Um, master students can take the qualifying exam. We have had master students take this. Um, if you get into the PhD program, um, we had one student this year who's a first year student this year who was a master's graduate last year. So she went from the master's program directly into the PhD program. And at the end of her second year of her master's, she took the qualifying exam. Um, and we have two parts of the qualifying exam. Um, so if you pass the qualifying exam at that point, you basically would enter into the PhD program already having passed the qualifying exam. So you'll basically be a second year PhD student as a first year student. So you'll be a year ahead. On the other hand, if you don't pass it, then you'll have to take it again later as a PhD student. Uh, computing is obviously really important, and as I said, Adam has started a new course in computing. Um, and we typically teach R in most of our courses, although um, you know SAS and STATA are very commonly used here in, this, in, the, in the research in the centers. Um, and so there are uh, there are available uh, courses in those as well. In terms of finance, um, the, the the School of Public Health gives us a pot of money which basically funds one quarter of all of the master's tuition. In other words, um, we, are, we are allowed to give back to our students one quarter of the total tuition. So we allocate that to our students, um, typically in a fairly uniform fashion, although sometimes it's not quite that everybody gets the same amount. Um, so people always have a question of, you know, how much is this going to cost and how much money can I get? Um, so you can kind of think as a rough approximation that the school gives you a quarter. The remaining money um, you are responsible for. Now, we realize that for a lot of students, that's a lot of money because a Brown course cost is about $6,000. So you know, even with a quarter off, you're still talking $4,500 per course. There's eight or nine courses. You can do the math. It's, a, you know, it's, it's an expensive um, proposition. So what we try to do is get as many um, jobs for you as we can. That said, with 30 students, it's hard to find a job for everybody. And it does differ depending on whether you are a permanent resident or citizen of the US or you have an international visa. If you have a visa, there are certain restrictions on what you can do. Um, you, for example, you can only work 20 hours a week. We do have research positions available in the centers. My center of evidence-based medicine usually employs about four master's students every year. Um, we try to get positions in the other centers. Some of the doctors in the hospitals have research um, uh, uh, programs that they hire students for. 
and local employers do as well. And so we're, we're continually trying to add to the, to the numbers of uh, positions that we, we can hook students up with. And that's certainly something you'll want to ask the other students about today in terms of what, you know, what their experiences have been. Um, here is a list of some of our graduates. And I just, it's, it's not totally up to date, um, although I think we have a lot from last year. But this just gives you a sense of what some of the things that our graduates do. So we have one student who's working at a, at a CRO in, in Tokyo at Quintiles. Uh, we have another student who is from Kenya who is now working in statistics in Kenya. We have a couple of students who are PhD candidates in, in, in either biostatistics or other fields. Um, we have people working at the, the government uh, and working as data scientists at different locations. Um, and um, we have some working in finance. Um, and. Um, so it's a, it's a wide wide range of, 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 uh, of disciplines that, that people go into. It's not all kind of typical healthcare. Uh, a lot of it is is working in the in the in the corporate environment. Um, here's some here's some more as well. So um, you know that will grow over time. Um, we do uh, work very closely with Brown, which is um, now rapidly ramping up. It's resources available for master students. So not only do we have the writing center, which is going to have its full time a full time graduate um, program uh, <coughs> member that Rachel will tell you about, who will be devoted directly to helping graduate students with writing. But we are also now will have a master's um, representative at Brown's Career Lab, which is our job placement service. Um, you can go directly to them. Plus, um, a lot of us uh, on the faculty have good connections with, with different companies or uh, different friends. Uh, for example, Carrie mentioned that she's from Pfizer. Um, I have several good colleagues who work at Pfizer, and we actually just had one come in uh, here this week to talk to the students about jobs in the pharmaceutical industry. We have uh, another uh, gentleman coming in from, from a local CRO to talk about data science uh, opportunities uh, next month, and we also have a couple of our uh, graduates who are working in data science coming to talk about um, their um, uh, their experiences as well. So we, we do our best to try to place you in environments where you can succeed. Um, so that's that's kind of the end of the presentation. Um, so I thought we have about we have 20 minutes or so, or maybe even a little more if we want to cut into our break. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Adam for any comments he might have, and then um, we can take questions. I, I think Chris did a good job of explaining anything. Um, is there anything we can do to answer some questions, give you a little bit more information on things? Um, I have sort of an existential question. They mentioned a bunch of centers that's mm -hmm. really interesting, mm -hmm. so students can get involved in those. Right. Um, so what does, that, what does that mean? How does one get involved in that? Okay. What does that entail? Um, so I mean, most of the centers, the well, they all have their web pages up and they list the faculty and the different research that faculty do. Um, so one of the easiest things would be is if you look at the center's web page, you look at some of the professors that are working on it, you can just email or contact any of them. Um, or you can find out where they're located and just uh, swing by and visit them. Um, so I mean, every everyone here at Brown is, is really easy to be reached. Um, and it's most professors don't mind if somebody just knocks on the door and, and comes in. Um, so it's very easy to get involved with the center because you can just look there, find a couple names, email them, start meeting with them, um, and see if there's something that you can work with them on. Um, or uh, some of us faculty who are affiliated with other centers, um, we would be more than happy to talk about those centers and, and get you connected in, in there as well. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons we have a lot of people in, in evidence-based medicine is I typically reach out to students and you know, let them know that we have a couple positions open that year, and anybody who's interested, please send a, a resume, and then we usually, uh, you know, I meet with the with the center director, and, and we um, hire people. Um, we have both research projects and applied projects, so we do a lot of meta analyses and systematic reviews where we need students to screen through abstracts and, and extract data. We also have uh, research grants where we're doing methodological research, and we need students to to program and run simulations and, and, and do research. And some of that will turn into theses as well. So um, you know, th that's, that's a direct connection through me, also through the Center for Statistical Sciences, which where a lot of the faculty are. There's 
connections to the, to the um, clinical trials that they run and, and some of the other programs. So, um, but the other centers have, have lots of um, faculty as well, and so um, you know, hopefully uh, as we grow as a program, you know, people will know that we have students who, who want to work in that area. Um, and and you, a lot of you, I know, have specific interests and, and specific experience, so um, you should certainly take advantage of that to, to locate the people. You know, um, for example, the new Hassenfeld Institute. Um, you know, is, is if you're interested in child health, that that would be a great thing to, to get involved with. So you don't have to start a totally fresh, different thesis if you're already doing research in one of these centers. You can use that for you. Right, a lot of our students do that. So we have one student, for example, who's working at Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, he's working. Um, they they had hired him to do a um, to do a program in. Um, they have a they have a behavioral medicine program for for people with mental health services, and they wanted to know um, whether this new program that they were had initiated was working. And um, so there were a lot of issues because the people who were offered the program were not the same as the people who were not offered the program, and so there were a lot of kind of complex statistical issues. So they brought him in to kind of put all the data together and to help them think about it. And um, he's turned that into his master's thesis. Yeah. But, uh, <clears throat> you mentioned that uh, the thesis was changing to add a project. It, would that affect our interim class? Yes, that, that would be for, for this year. So the idea really is, um, you know, in the past, we've had some students who didn't graduate on time because they didn't get their thesis done. And part of that was because what was required was a fairly, um, you know, intensive paper that had to be a very high quality and uh, to be a publishable quality. Um, whereas what a lot of students will have done is they might have worked on a research project and they've done, for example, a statistical analysis for a project that they're working on, um, but it, it doesn't turn into a whole paper. Um, mm -hmm. And to finish the whole paper, we'll, Papers just take a long time to write, and so we really want to make sure that people graduate on time. So um, we've decided that really the important thing is to get the experience. It's not necessarily as a master's student to publish a paper. Um, and so um, if you're just working on a project and you, for example, write um, a, um, uh, a report um, you know, as part of that project, that, that would qualify as well. The other reason for the project would be um, a lot of times if you're doing something in the center, you're going to be starting on a project that might just be starting up. And so you might just spend all of your time helping them clean, uh, get the data prepared. You might do a little bit of base analyses, but nothing that you've done is uh, ready to be published because they might not even be done collecting all of the data yet. So you might just be doing some interim stuff, but we don't want to dissuade you from getting involved in a project from the start because uh, that's a great experience and it might even lead to a job on that project in the future. Um, so with the project, instead of a thesis, you can write about what you're doing, even if what you're doing isn't going to be ready to be published for five or six years. You might still be on a paper five or six years from now when they finish collecting all the data and doing a little bit more work with it. Uh, but we don't want to discourage anyone from doing that kind of project. Um, so that's one of the reasons we're doing it, because we recognize that it's a lot of work, it's a lot of effort, um, but it won't be something that you could publish right away, because it's just not possible yet. Uh, and one follow-up question. Uh, look like we have some classes two weeks before the semester starts. Mm -hmm. What dates are those running? And this might be case specific, but if you already have some summer appointments. Right. Um, so they, so typically a Brown starts right after Labor Day. It's usually the Wednesday after Labor Day. And you know, of course, that varies from year to year. And so. Um, our orientation would begin two weeks before Labor Day. Um, that's typically the way we do it. Um, the way it's usually set up is the first week is mostly this math workshop. Um, and um, I believe that Brown has an international orientation that week as well. So if you're an international student, you would go through the orientation. That's where you'd find out about all the, the your, your, your visas and all that, uh, how that connects to, to, to your um, uh, Brown student status. And then the second week, the week before Labor Day, we would finish up the math workshop, but there's also three days of Brown orientation, two days of public health orientation, and one day uh, with the graduate school. Now, that said, um, not all of our students go through all the orientation, particularly if you've already got some connection with the university. Um, but uh, 
and, and with the with the math workshop, we recognize that every year some people can't make the whole thing because they've got other commitments. We also have international students who may not actually be able to come to the country. Um, so what we do is we you know we require it, but we do recognize that that there are situations that occur. And so um, I think this year we probably will be taping it as well. Um, and we also um, offer uh, material over the summer um, that you know you can you can review on your own. Orientation is September second, and the International Student Offices and Scholars orientation is August twenty fifth to twenty sixth. Okay, so, so we would probably be starting the twenty second then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. And then ours would probably be That's the thirtieth. Right. Ish. Right. We have two days for School of Public Health. Okay. How long, this might be a silly question, but on average, how long is a typical master's thesis? Obviously, you're only working with those master um, Well, my experience has been there, you know, maybe 40, 50 pages. I mean, it really depends on, you can obviously pad them if there's a lot of appendices where you have, you know, your data or your code or whatever, but I would say about 40 pages written probably, yeah. I mean, that said, there was one guy last year who did a 180-page thesis, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I had to read it. Uh, that's why I know how long it was. <laughs> the other thing is, is sometimes if you if you do something novel and you actually do some sort of uh, statistical proof or you create some new method, it could also be shorter depending on yeah. if there's not much literature review on that area and your proof was relatively short or easy to implement, um, you could also yeah. have shorter. It's like if you prove something cool but it's only a page, does that count? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, you, you know, if, I mean, if it's that novel, I don't think we would general rel it. relativity. I mean, um, yeah, you could. It's rare as a yeah. master's <laughs> student to have proven something that that novel that would only take a page. <laughs> Even yeah, as a faculty I, member, I would, it's very rare. Yeah, I would be very happy to put my name on yeah. <laughs> with a student on that if it was that right. that amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if they made it into every textbook. Kind yes. Of <laughs> I just wonder uh, something about the research provision and uh, when can, can people apply for that provision okay. and how? Yeah. Um, well, so, so um, you know, a lot of times the, the people that you would be working with will want to interview you before they, you know, because they, they're, so, so it, it often is after you arrive. Um, but what we try to do is, you know, over the summer, if you have certain interests, um, we might be able to hook you up with somebody to talk to and you might be able to set something up ahead of time. So um, basically every time there is a job offered, um, somebody will put a posting up at the school and the department will email every single student. Um, every single one of the research positions isn't something where we just pick a student out and say, well, we're going to give this to you. It's basically you apply to it. It's just like a job. You'll go through, you'll, you'll submit your application, your resume. You might do a couple interviews with them. Um, and then they'll make the decision based on that. So we will notify everyone, and there's also a website that lists all of these. Um, so it'll be up to you at that point to go ahead and say, is this something I could be interested in? Um, take the time, uh, apply for it, interview for it. Um, but it will be treated just like a job, uh, which is also good experience. So, um, you know, the other thing we do is we do bring in, you know, local employers, as I was saying, to to talk to you about opportunities. Um, and sometimes people will call us up and say they have an opening and we will then invite them to come and they might actually interview people on campus. Um, a lot of times though, they will want students with certain experience and so you know, in your first semester, you may or may not, depends really on what your background is. Because um, a lot of these jobs, they, they really need good programmers. Um, and so it really depends. I mean, if you're a good programmer, it's gonna be easier to find a job than if you really don't have much programming experience. Um, so again, that's something to think about um, before you come to a program is, you know, try to get some of those skills ahead of time so that you're sort of ready, ready to, to move forward right away. And there's like, for, for R, for example, there's a lot of great courses online. You can just sort of learn it yourself. Um, uh, yeah. I just wanted to ask for the research positions, is that the same deal as the apprenticeships mentioned in the handbook or is that different? Um, yeah, I think it's pretty similar. Um, I don't really recall the language in the handbook. Um, oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, research apprenticeship, research assistantship, we call them RAs. Um, so there, there's really two different kinds of jobs. Um, one is the, the formal research assistantship, which is done through the university. And what that does is it um, 
So at the master's level, we've set up a specific type of research assistantship. What it gives you is, let's say you, you do it for the full academic year. It would, pay, it, would give, it would pay for one of your courses each semester. It pays for your health insurance. And it also gives you a, a monthly stipend, which is, I can't remember how much it is, but it's like the total package, I think, for the year is about $30,000. So given what you've looked at there, that you're taking basically two or three courses a semester, and the school is giving you a quarter of it. If you had one of these research assistantships, it basically pays for most of your tuition. You're going to have very little tuition left. That said, those are fairly expensive. So a lot of times, particularly with outside employers, they may not actually want to do that. They may actually just want to em employ you and give you an hourly wage. And just to follow up with that question, you mentioned that there are some restrictions for international students. Mm -hmm. And I know there are a lot, a lot of cool centers that are associated. Right. So I don't know if that's like a word, being an RA in those centers would be something that uh, allow for international students or yeah. only like on campus working with that. Um, in, with international students, you just have the limit of you can only work 20 hours a week. Mm -hmm. So you would only be able to take a position where it's 20 hours a week. But most of the RA positions, <coughs> They already know that you're a full-time student, so they do cap it at 20 hours a week. Um, and our contracts with like the hospitals and that that we would sign for a student doing an RA position there cap that at 20 hours a week as well. Um, so those are all available to um, international students. Some of the outside companies that might want to hire somebody for more than 20 hours a week, then that type of position would be limited um, to, to a domestic yeah. student or somebody on a different type of visa. Um, however, anything that the school offers for research yep. assistantship, they, they only, they cap it at 20 hours a week because they don't want students focusing on jobs. They want you being able to learn and, and be a part of the environment here. Um, so there are a lot of positions that are, are available for international students, and there's probably only a few of them that wouldn't be due to right. that extra hours. I mean, legally, you're, you, as an international student, you're on a student visa. So any employment you have has to come through the university. So for example, if you're working for an outside employer, they would actually contract with the university. You would be paid through the university. Whereas if you're a citizen or a permanent resident, you can get your own job. So you could make your own relationship with that. Although that said, we, we do like to help students do this because we don't want you to be taken advantage of where you get into a job situation where somebody says we're going to pay you a certain amount and then you just find it's a horrible situation. and. You've got no support. So if you do it through us, at least we can kind of, if things are going badly, we can call them. And hopefully this is somebody that we know well, and they wouldn't do that to you. But. The school, for the, for the school contracts in that end, the school actually did hire an attorney to make sure that the students and the school's interest are maintained and kept by it. Um, so you're protected by Brown by having, by going through Brown at that point. Um, so it's a much bigger backer than you trying to, defend yourself out in there on your own and having somebody try to take advantage of you. Um, so our goal is to make sure that you have opportunities, but also to make sure that nobody's trying to make it so that you can't get your studies done or so that you start to do poorly because they're taking too much of your time. So let's say if a student do got a uh, research assistantship somewhere and does that yearly turn out to be his or her thesis at the end? Which it it often happen? does, actually. Um, so, you know, if you're, for example, you're working with a doctor in a hospital and, and, and you know, oftentimes these are research projects, so they're, they're, they're hiring you to, as some sort of study they're doing, um, you can oftentimes, um, you know, they'll write a paper on that and that can become your thesis. Or you might do some kind of secondary data analysis that's supporting work. So I'll give you an example. I'm working, one of our students right now is doing her thesis with me. And it's a project that um, another student actually worked on last year, um, a doctor at Rhode Island Hospital um, who is in international health, um, is developing a model for predicting um, children with diarrhea <coughs> who are dehydrated and, and trying to figure out how to treat them. And so there's, there's basically, if, you're, if, if the child is severely dehydrated, you need to put them on intravenous fluids. If the child is moderately dehydrated, you can give them an oral rehydration solution. And if they're not very dehydrated, you can send them home. Um, the problem is that in a lot of the um, places in the world where this happens, and, and he's working in Bangladesh, um, there's, there's a lot of 
children who are having problems, and there are not very many clinicians to treat them. Um, so uh, I think that the, the, the clinic that he's working in like has something like 17 million admissions a year, some, some amazing number. And so what he's trying to do is come up with a very simple kind of triage that people who are not experts in the area can, for example, look at the child and say, <coughs> this child is, you know, they've got, they, they, they can't cry, they're thirsty, their, their eyes look sunken and so forth. What are the characteristics that would indicate whether they're severely dehydrated or moderately so that we could triage them properly? So this is something which has been published. He's now validating the model. And so she's working, she's working as the data analyst on it, so she'll get her name on the paper, but she's also doing some additional analyses to explore different <coughs> ways of analyzing the data. So we're using um, ordinal logistic regression for, the, um, for the, the data analysis, but we've also explored things like neural networks and classification trees and so forth. And she's looking at various measures of calibration and discrimination. And so that hopefully can be written up as some sort of a little methods paper for her as well. Another question, when you mentioned about the required coursework, uh, I noticed, I feel that it's not as many as some other programs at mm -hmm. other schools require. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's just because they um, break up this out of courses to little pieces while we sort of yeah. combine, you know, maybe probability with friends like in one, or um, like, if you have any comment on that. I mean, I can comment <coughs> from one of the most direct competitors, uh, which would be Harvard. Um, I just came from there. Um, so for example, students at Harvard would take, uh, they would take a regression course and then they would take a course called, um, that deals with like uh, categorical data called rates and proportions. And so those courses cover probably about two thirds of we, what we cover in our regression course. So we cover all of that material and then some. So at Harvard you would take 12 courses. Well, one of our classes covers more than two of their classes. Um, and I know this because I worked with those classes when I was a student there, and I worked with the master's students. So a lot of these programs, you will see 12, 13, 14 courses. Um, but we do teach material, uh, and we move through material fairly quickly. Um, the probability and inference class that you'll take um, that I've uh, created this past year, and I'm, I think I'm teaching it again this year. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure yet. Um, but what I end up doing is, um, for example, if you go to a lot of places, you take the first semester, you take a probability course, and then you take an inference course the next semester. Well, we've actually combined that into one class. Um, so we cover through all the probability distributions in one semester, and then we get up to the same level of inference that most PhD students have. So we don't cover it as high of a theoretical level as they do, but we do cover the same exact material. Um, so there are some different types of hypothesis testing and confidence interval creation um, that you normally wouldn't see until you're in a PhD, um, but we actually make sure that you're out of here with that. So just for those two classes alone, you're combining uh, four classes at most other programs. Um, so it does seem like a lot less that you're getting, um, but we really are moving quickly through those courses, um, which means if you're taking two or three courses and you're covering as much material um, as we are, you probably don't want to be taking four or five courses every semester like you would be at other places. Yeah, I mean, I have to say when I, when I teach, one of the questions that's always on the student survey is how many hours did you spend outside of class? And, um, you know, there, there's usually several options there, you know, two to three hours, four to five hours. I like it when students have like nine to 12 hours or something, you know. Um, I mean, I, I, I really think, because I remember as a grad student, most of the learning I did was on my own. Um, and you really need to think about it. You need to, you need to work out problems. Um, and uh, you, you need to just gain some experience. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're spending 15 hours a week on each of your three courses, that's, that's pretty full-time work. And, and I think that you'll, you'll learn a lot that way. Um, Other questions? You know, that was per if, if there are no more questions, it's actually perfect timing. We couldn't have done any better than that. It's 10.30. Um, but we don't have to stop if you have more questions. <coughs> the other thing is if you think of anything throughout the day, I mean, all of us are going to be around. As soon as you go up to the seventh floor, uh, my office is in this back corner. Um, that way you'll, you'll be able to see it up there. You can just pop in if I'm in there. Um, you can just 
to stop in and ask us any questions. So it's not it's not a problem if you don't have one now, but you think of something later. We're, we're around. Okay. Actually, I have one small question. So usually, like, we have two courses per semester or three courses per semester. Then we have more option now. We can take, like, one or two courses from other departments. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You, so you, you could also, you know, it really, if you do a research assistantship or a job, that's going to be 20 hours a week too, hopefully. So, yeah, you know, that's yeah. like a full course yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, and and really, I would I would you know really strongly suggest that you spend as much time on that as you can, because really that's what you're going to be doing. I, I, I would really yeah. appreciate I, if I can take other department course, because I know like from a lot of other programs they are not allowed. Yeah. Yeah. No, you 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 certainly able to do that. And you said you can take. Um, Courses other departments, but they don't count towards. Yeah, in other words, um, e there are a few exceptions. Um, we have we have some on our our list. Um, for example, uh, I'll, I'll give you like the applied math department has a course in non-parametric statistics, so that would you know we don't teach that or time series. Uh, there's a there's um, a course in time series. So those are kind of things that you you probably could get credit for. But for example, if you want to take a course in econometrics, we probably wouldn't count that or. Um, or computing algorithms or something like that. I mean, they're great courses to take, but they're not for the biostatistics degree. Yeah. I had a question about the data science track you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And you said we were trying to, they were um, trying to implement it next year. Is that like this coming year or the year after that? Yeah, I think That's it's for small. this coming year. And so what, what I did, actually didn't have a slide on that. What that would um, entail, and, and we don't actually haven't approved this as a faculty yet, but the idea is that in your first semester, you would take um, inference and computing. Um, was that epidemiology the other one, or was that yeah. okay? And epidemiology, and then in your second semester, you take regression and another computing class. So, the second, the first computing class would be more kind of basic statistical computing, but how do I do a simulation? How do I do an optimization? What, you know, how do I program? Your second computing course would be more like the types of things that are used in big data. Like in databases and, um, and large algorithms. Right. So it would be learning things with like Hadoop, Apache, um, as okay. well as learning um, some machine learning aspects for large algorithms and getting you ready to handle big data, uh, which is not just a course only for people who want to do a data science track. It's actually going to be something that would be allowed for any master's student. Um, who might just want to learn some more methods that okay. don't necessarily want to just specialize oh, in data science. Yeah. Um, How does the curriculum handle those? Um, so we don't really take strong size either way. I mean, most mm -hmm. of us use both techniques. I call myself a Bayesian, but I don't really do Bayesian inference that often when I'm doing standard things. Um, I like to kind of think of it as well. I'm doing likelihood-based methods, and so I can sort of pretend they're Bayesian if they're non-informative priors. But you know, that said, the only formal course we have in Bayesian statistics is our Bayesian inference course. Although most of the courses will touch on Bayesian aspects. I mean, I'm sure Adam, you must do that in in the inference course. And we did a little bit in inference, yeah. not too much. I okay. mean, it was more more frequentist approach for right. our inference class. Um, um, however, the computing class, like. Um, you know, in their homework assignments, they've been <coughs> working on bootstrapping, jackknife. Um, so we are doing other techniques that fall in line of lines yeah. of more Bayesian than uh, than frequentists with computing. I mean, I think modern statistics. You know, um, <coughs> we use whatever technique we have to to get the right answer. You know, so there's a lot of problems where Bayesian inference is maybe the only thing that's possible because the problem is so big. Um, and there's, there's other problems where there's such a simple, yeah. unique solution with frequentists that it's much yeah. better just to go with that method than try to program some complex thing that's going to give you the same answer. So we'll learn both and utilize Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, so good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Good morning. Good, good. So my name is Rachel Toncelli, and I'm the director of English Language Learning uh, in the Writing Center. And so I'm here to talk to you about writing support and English language support. I don't really know the makeup of who's in the room, so uh, if you don't need English language support, you have my permission to just ignore me for a few minutes. And if you do, then I have some really good information for you. But what I want to start with is just writing in general. So um, how many of you think you are perfect writers. 
<laughs> right. I work in a writing center, and I can't raise my hand at that, at that prompt either. Because there's no such thing, right? Every writer benefits from having a reader, right? And that's the service that the writing center provides. So the writing center is up the hill. Uh, in the main campus, uh, right in a very central location in J. Walter Wilson, which is uh, where the post office is, so that's kind of a, an easy place to find. And the service that we provide in the Writing Center is a really fantastic, supportive service. So when you book an appointment in the Writing Center, what you get is one hour with a person who's not only a great writer, but also trained in composition theory to help you uh, feel more confident about your writing. And the neat thing about an appointment at the Writing Center is that it's customized to whatever your particular concerns are. So that means when you come in for an appointment, you sit down, and the Writing Center associate you're working with will ask you, what are you worried about? What are your concerns? And people come in with all kinds of concerns. Some people worried about the strength of their argument, their organization, grammar, punctuation, you name it, right? Um, and you're allowed to come in with any kind of question. And what you get is a really skilled, really talented, really compassionate reader who's not grading you. And so it can be a very helpful part of the writing process. And people come in at all stages of the writing process, which means some people come in with fully developed uh, papers or dissertations, and other people come in um, with a cocktail napkin and some notes <laughs> that they scribble down. And the point is, you could come in with your writer's block, or you could come in with something that you feel is pretty close to being done and anything in between, and we'll work with you and we'll meet you where you are to help you feel like not only you're getting a better paper, but you're becoming a better writer. Sound good? Great. So that's a service that's free uh, to everyone in the Brown community and available to you, but it is a popular service, so when you get to campus, if you think you want to take advantage of it, we'd encourage you to start putting in your appointment requests early, as soon as you know you have things that you have to write. Um, uh, start booking ahead for those. And that's essentially the service at the Writing Center. Uh, for English language learners, uh, anyone whose first language is an English who needs to fine tune any aspect of the language, from uh, listening comprehension, speaking, presentations, reading, writing, we offer additional support. And you have a handout that I gave you for that if it applies to you. Um, and so we offer customized uh, writing conferences. And so let's say you are worried about your writing, but you want to do something a little bit more proactive and maybe really take a look at the kinds of mistakes you're making or maybe what some of the cultural differences in writing might be, you could work with an English language learning specialist as opposed to just a standard writing center associates and sort of uh, think more proactively about improving your writing skill. And so that's a really great service that we offer. And we also offer a whole schedule every semester of uh, English language workshops which range from proofreading and editing to particular kinds of writing, like writing an abstract, writing a literature review, to also all kinds of really fun communicative workshops, right? Just uh, workshops to help you feel more confident in your spoken English and your ability to read the newspaper. Or today uh, at 12, I don't think any of you are free, but today at 12 we're hosting a workshop on um, local menus, right? So we've gathered all the menus from local restaurants, which can be a challenging feat if English isn't your first language. And we're having a, a pretty exciting quiz show challenge uh, with those menus. So we do a lot of really fun things uh, designed to holistically improve your English learning, uh, uh, your English abilities. So. That's essentially the service that we provide. One extra thing that we've been doing uh, with the School of Public Health, and in particular with the Department of Biostatistics, is we've been offering a, um, a specialized writing and oral communication development workshop this year for anyone who's really interested in improving their um, written and spoken English. And I think that they mentioned that this morning. If you're interested in writing the thesis and English isn't your first language, uh, and you need to develop that skill a little bit more, that that's available to you as well. So there are a lot of support systems um, designed to help you integrate into campus, feel confident with writing, feel confident with language, and so I hope you'll take advantage of them. Any questions? No? Okay. Okay, well, good luck. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day here. I know you have a lot of information coming in. Um, I hope you're able to catch everything you need, and maybe I'll see you next fall. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Does Brown have public speaking classes that, like, 
we would maybe be able to audit or something? Yeah, so at the undergraduate level, and I'm pretty sure you could audit them, we have some amazing un, um, courses in persuasive communication offered by Professor Tannenbaum, who's actually really quite famous. And also she offers those workshops through the Sheridan Center for Teaching and Learning. They offer a lot of evening workshops. Um, in communication, in presentation, in teaching. Actually, as a graduate student, you might also want to look into, they offer uh, a teaching certificate program. So if you think part of your future career might involve teaching, that's a, another free program that you could take advantage of to enhance your skill set um, before you leave graduate school. And they do offer all kinds of workshops in um, communication and presentation as well. Sure. Anyone else? Yes. The Writing Fellows Program is uh, recruiting only undergraduate students? So at the moment, the Writing, Fellow, uh, the Writing Fellows Program does recruit undergraduates, but we are expanding. Um, we recruited a few medical students this year, and I think the plan is to also begin recruiting um, graduate students. Um, but we do hire also graduate students in the Writing Center to work as Writing Center Associates. So if you really enjoy writing and really enjoy working with writers, that could be something you could consider as a part-time job. Yep. Sure. Anyone else? All right, great. Well, it was nice meeting you this morning. Enjoy the rest of your day, and good luck.